A person can simply say, this one is definitely better, I've decided and that's it. They don't even look. So everyone understands that if we take away what people have acquired, they'll be upset and you'll lose your audience. Oleg, have you heard that in the new smart Xiaomi kettles you can run Android apps? And that's what we'll talk about today, about A-B testing in games for beginners. So what are we talking about today? What is A-B testing and why do we need it? A-B testing is a tool in development that allows you to test a hypothesis to see whether it's successful or not. Most beginners do it like this. They simply add their change to the game, release it in the store where their game or app is published, and then watch to see if any parameter that the change was supposed to affect goes up. For example, whether people started playing more or buying more in-game items or services. That's what you say in the best case scenario. A person might just say, this is definitely better, I've decided so, and that's it. They don't even check. Yes, that's quite possible. Uh, but when it comes to commercial development, such actions can lead to very unfortunate consequences, primarily financial losses. So A-B testing is a tool that allows you to split your users into cohorts, and in each cohort, you test one of your change variants. Accordingly, we divide all our users into two cohorts, apply variant A to one cohort and variant B to the other. That's why tests are called A-B tests. We compare the results we obtained in these cohorts, and then, based on the data received, we make a decision about which variant performed better, and we apply it to all our users. What parameters can be improved through A-B testing? Basically, we can improve any parameters that can be measured. Is it possible to test technical parameters? The number of ANR crashes, FPS, and similar things. Great question. The tools we'll discuss provide such capabilities and you can use A-B testing to check these kinds of parameters. Next question. Are there always only two variants in A-B testing or can there be more? Yes, there are. But if we talk about some nuances, for example, you can apply four changes to your product by splitting users into four cohorts instead of two. You increase the waiting time for results in proportion to the number of variants you introduce for your variables. How can you tell? Is your cohort unambiguous or not? There are online statistical calculators. This is the simplest and fastest way which allows you to enter the number of people in the cohort and the deviation you obtained as a percentage from the baseline version you are comparing to. And in addition, if we talk about a tool like Firebase, which is the main one for me at least, it calculates all these values automatically. The higher the observed deviation, the smaller the cohort cohort of users needed for the result to be trustworthy. Can everything be tested? Next question. And here are some points about what might prevent us from conducting a particular test. For example, we might find ourselves in a situation where we want to A-B test a very large scale change in our product. That is, A-B testing is generally suitable for small changes. If our change turns out to be large scale enough, you might find yourself in a situation where you want to drastically alter the core gameplay of your game, and the amount of changes would be so significant that within one game you'd essentially have have to create two separate games. A slash B testing works best for small incremental changes. Next, let's talk about traffic volume. We've discussed this. If you have low traffic, it will be very difficult for you to do A-B testing because small deviations require a lot of traffic. A slow response means, for example, if the changes you made are encountered by the user only on the 30th or 60th day of gameplay, in other words, it's some kind of long-term content. It may also turn out that such A-B testing will require a significant investment of time resources to check the results of this change. Multiplayer, why is written in parentheses with reservations? Uh, because in multiplayer, it's important for users to have the same playing conditions. And if your A-B testing affects, say, the ability of some users to win while others don't have access to that feature, people will be very upset with you and you'll lose your audience. You can do A-B testing with multiplayer on a separate server, for example, assign a dedicated server for the B group cohort, where people will play under equal conditions. Sellable content. In some countries, due to GDPR laws, you cannot change the prices of certain sellable content in the game after they have been initially announced. You need to create different content to test, because you've already sold that content to some people at one price, and by the laws of some countries, you are not allowed to sell the same content to others at a different price. The in-game economy adds complexity to A-B testing. And this is because when you change the economic balance in the game for one cohort of users and they start doing something, buying things progressing in some way, if you then conclude that this A-B test had a negative effect, especially a significant negative effect, uh, I mean, everyone understands that if we start taking away what people have already acquired and roll them back to the previous model, those people will simply leave. Distribution tools are what we use to divide people into cohorts. First and foremost, I always use Firebase. Firebase provides this tool for free. It's 
it's a powerful tool from Google that's very closely integrated with the Google Play Store, but it also allows you to work with iOS applications without any issues. You could also mention AppMetrica. It's another powerful tool that allows you to do similar things, offering a wide range of functionalities. But I would say that it's a bit limited in terms of its functionality. And there's also a similar tool built into Unity, but I only know of its existence and haven't used it myself. Analytics tools are what you use to process and analyze the results you get. And this essential functionality is also seamlessly built into Firebase, and it's completely free. There, you can comprehensively analyze the results you've meticulously obtained across a very wide and diverse range of different parameters and metrics. Next, we have a slide that looks at two distribution options, config-based and version-based. These are the ways in which we will divide people into cohorts. The config-based option is when you create a certain variable in, well, let's talk about Firebase as a distribution tool. And in Firebase, under the tab called remote config, you create a variable whose value you can then retrieve in your product's code. You set this value accordingly in the Firebase console, and then you release a fresh build of your product. And within this build, your users, who will be split into two cohorts by Firebase, will receive different values for the variable you created in the Firebase console. And based on the value of this variable, you provide the user with the experience that corresponds to their cohort. By the way, you can analyze not just one parameter, but several, and make decisions based on the combined results obtained from these parameters. The second option is version-based, which is a more complex and more professional approach. You roll out a new build with the implemented changes to 50% of your audience. You also have 50% of your audience on the old build. Why shouldn't you consider using this particular solution? The fundamental problem is that Google still independently pushes out updates to its various services. So you release version 3.91 and roll it out to 50% of your users. But according to its own algorithms, Google updates some users who were on version 3.90 yesterday to version 3.91. And what do you end up with? Which makes sense. What happens is that yesterday you had 10,000 users on version 3.90. Let's say the change isn't that significant. So in both cohorts, there should have been, for example, 3,000 users each by today. But since some of those users have updated, you'll have 2,850 users on one version and 3,150 on the other. And the new version will automatically show better metrics than the old one because of these transitions. Uh, that's certainly one of the key points I truly wanted to mention. Thank you, Oleg. Analyzing version-based A-B testing is a bit more complicated because in any case, people will be moving between your cohorts. Be sure to set the first session date. This is a Firebase parameter, yes, in the context of A-B testing. If you don't set it, this A-B test will show you the weather, not the results. Ensure old users don't end up in the A-B test. The only more or less reasonable use of version-based testing is when you're testing different mediation versions because in that case, you run into major difficulties specifically with remote config. Version-based testing is recommended in 3D games after you've optimized the graphics. It's better to do tech updates through version-based testing and product updates through config-based testing. Never mix one with the other under any circumstances. This is really important. A slash B test should be targeted. You should always make the changes you're testing atomic. Let's call them that. Uh, because if you make two changes in the game, and for example, one has a positive effect and the other a negative one, and as a result, you break even, you never know that the first change was good and correct and the second one was bad. You either keep both of them or roll both of them back. As a result, you don't end up with the most optimal version. The first point is that you shouldn't always take A-B testing results at face value because a certain parameter in the A-B test might have stayed the same for one cohort if that's the default value, while for another, for example, it increased or, say, decreased. You should take into account that people in different countries, for example, play differently. And using the analytics tools we've already discussed, you can break down your A-B testing results and view them, for example, by country. And all of this is only relevant if you have a large audience and at least up to 10,000 users per country so that the results are statistically significant platform, traffic source, device type, and model. In other words, all these points allow us to fine-tune, let's say, to more precisely apply the results of our A-B testing and achieve better outcomes. If you are running several A-B tests in your game, you should always check how each new A-B test performed for each cohort. The duration of the test is important. The test should last long enough. If you quickly get good results, you shouldn't implement them right away. If you run a test and, for example, only two or three weeks have passed and you get positive results in the first three or four days, you shouldn't implement them right away. This could be due to a novelty effect, or it could be influenced by factors like weekends, holidays, or New Year's. Also, burnout or users getting used to a feature has an effect. A new feature you introduce might give an instant boost. This relates to the duration of A-B testing, but over the long term, this feature might bore users 
losers or somehow break the game by. It's a very nice tool in its own way, really cool. This is a tool that automatically applies the most optimal values for each user individually. This tool delivers fairly quick results. It trains for 10 days and then reports that, compared to your baseline, it has increased revenue by 3.2% by distributing different A-B testing variants to different user groups. There is a downside though, it's a black box. We don't know which users were assigned to which variant by the Firebase personalization. We have no way uh, using Firebase itself to analyze or see on what basis and to whom the different variants were assigned. It's suitable for beginners or those who don't want to get into the details. It's really about getting quick results as long as you're okay with the limitations I just mentioned. And it's not suitable for multiplayer games and similar cases due to the limitations I've already mentioned, but overall if you're fine with the restrictions it imposes, it's a really cool and fast tool you can use in your projects, especially for beginner developers. That's all, thank you. Friends, leave your questions in the comments. We'll definitely answer them in future episodes. Thank you very much for watching this entire episode with us today.